So to get further into instructions, I first want to break down the major categories of instructions. One thing I want to note is that I'm not going to pick on a particular instruction set here. Um, what I really want you to know is the broad types of instructions and what they're used for and how those types of instructions work more than I care about you knowing a particular instruction set. So I'm not going to um, only work with you know, ARM version 8 or 7. I'm not only going to work with Intel or MIPS or any particular instruction set. Uh, what I'm going to do instead is talk to instructions as a general term and what they do and how they affect hardware. Because uh, these general categories of instructions do in fact cover all major computing devices. And they're more informative to you as a programmer who's much more likely to be programming at a high level anyway um, to how these things are working under the covers then it actually matters that you know the, the bits and pieces and the details of, say, how to do it in a very particular architecture. One thing I want to point out off the bat is that there's a few instructions that don't manipulate data. Although most instructions do, there are a few that don't. Uh, some are like branching that we've already worked with that deal with flow. Um, others we've also seen is like our halt, which is also coffee break and little man computer, which would, would end our, the execution of our program. But there's one more we haven't talked about, and that's a no-op. So a no-op or a no-operation is meant to actually just be a delay. It's meant to be something was not supposed to happen yet, so I'm going to waste a CPU cycle. Um, now that might seem a little counterintuitive because we're kind of taught that, you know, like you should never just have um, a loop that kind of does nothing, you know, per se to waste time in an ideal world. Uh, but when you're working at a low level, there could be a situation where you need that to happen. Uh, one example, and this isn't something that's common today, but one example is that early machines uh, didn't necessarily have a good mechanism or a good pipeline flow to deal with the fact that it took longer to get some information from memory, or say even worse, I.O., uh, than it did for the CPU to continue running different uh, processes within the ALU and the registers. So if you wanted to, say, access something in memory, you might actually have to perform a no operation for a certain amount of cycles to ensure that the data you wanted to get from memory could, in fact, have time to get back to the memory data register where you could then access it. Um, so there is sometimes a need to have this no operation where you're effectively telling the computer to do nothing. But again, most instructions do in fact deal with data movement. Um, so I'm going to talk at a high level about these now and we'll, we'll, deal, uh, we'll dive a little bit more into them in a moment. Um, but they're either data movement, uh, we can also use arithmetic, uh, Boolean logic. Um, there's also registers that deal with, um, you know, manipulating a single operand, so like, you know, incrementing, uh, incrementing decrementing, that kind of thing, um, negating um, bit shifts, rotates. We're going to talk about all of these in a little bit more detail. Um, how we control our programs, so things like branching, but we're also going to talk about calls. Um, I actually have a, a separate video about a program call on the stack because that's kind of its own unique concept uh, that's important. Uh, stack instructions to deal with the stack, um, multiple data instructions, we'll talk to that as basically a way where we can affect um, you know, maybe more than one piece of data the same way at the same time. And we also need to worry about I.O., um, how we're going to deal with input and output and machine control. So data movement, you have actually already done most of this. So you've worked a lot with load and store but you haven't seen move yet, right? So we know that load and store is a way to either get information from memory or store information into memory. A move comes into play where we have maybe more than one register, which is usually the case. And we want to move information from one register to another, right? So a move is something that comes into play in real architectures because we have multiple pieces of hardware in which to deal with. Um, later, we're going to talk about pipelining and multiple execution units. 
and the need for this will become more clear. We're going to have uh, ALUs, for example, that are specific to integer arithmetic and ALUs that are specific to floating point. Um, and we might have more than one and we might have, um, you know, specific registers that are actually intended for different types of data, like some are intended for multimedia data, MMX registers. Uh, so we'll, we'll kind of look in more detail as we go through that. Uh, but for now, just realize that we need to move because we're going to have different types of hardware and we need to move information uh, from one piece of hardware to another. The simplest form there is just from one register to another because you will have more than one general purpose register. So what do some of these things look like as actual instructions? And these examples I'm showing ARM, but again, I'm not going to have this on the test. I'm not going to ask you what the ARM uh, version 7 uh, instruction is for a move, right? What I want you to know though broadly is that instruction sets have a move and what it does, right? But I also want to round this out with examples. So here we see that move is MOV, um, load is comes in different flavors depending on how we're loading. Are we loading a single piece of information or possibly multiple? We'll talk about how you might be able to load multiple pieces of information at the same time, a wide path data bus and uh, some other pieces that come into play there, but we'll, we'll grow into that as we evolve. Um, a push and pop to manage our stack, um, things for signed and unsigned, um, arithmetic. Now, we have to have instructions to deal with how we're going to add, um, not just add, but are we dealing with integer numbers? Are we dealing with floating point? There actually is going to be different hardware usually uh, in order to deal with that. And remember, anytime we add different hardware, we have to have the instructions that manipulate that hardware. We learn that that's that um, intrinsic relationship, right, between the hardware and the instruction set that makes it the instruction set architecture. Um, we might also have instructions for binary coded decimal. Mm -hmm. This of course is going to uh, be reliant on if in fact that architecture uses binary coded decimal. Remember we talked about the fact that it's mostly used in uh, scientific calculators and uh, system Z's and things like that. But there still is binary coded decimal support in legacy versions of uh, Intel's processors, especially the 32-bit ones. So those instructions do exist in the 32-bit instruction set uh, and can be used. But generally speaking, today they don't uh, get used on uh, the desktop class or the, the laptop class of machines. Um, here are some examples of arithmetic uh, instructions. So something as simple as a basic add or subtract or a multiply. Um, you might have to deal with signed and unsigned uh, numbers. And, and we learned about how we would actually deal with that with the numbers data, right? If they're complementary numbers. Um, you might have to do a, you know, compare of a negative or a positive number. Um, maybe because you're setting a flag here because later you're going to check a condition uh, with a branch or something like that. Um, these are all examples of how you can use mathematical operations. Um, and then there's Boolean logic, right? So we know we have not, and, or, exclusive, or, things like this. Um, these can be used for comparison. So, you know, if somewhere in my program I want to see if two things are the same or if something is true or false. Um, but they can also be used for things like actually determining the complement of a number. If I'm creating a choose complement number, I might need to invert the bits with not gates, for example. Um, and these are what those instructions might look like. So uh, they are pretty straightforward. And or um, those make a, a lot of sense, right? Exclusive or it's an e, not an x, but same idea. Um, you know, there's also the bitwise operations. I can reverse bits, I can uh, clear bits, I can change sign to unsign, that kind of thing. And I want to take a moment to talk a little bit about a shift and a rotate because you might not have encountered those terms before. And they are important, especially when dealing at this uh, low level. So what I'm doing if I'm doing a shift is I'm effectively either doubling or having a number. So let me give you an example. Because these are all powers of two, uh, if I have a number in binary, say it's uh, 4, and I have 4 bits to represent it, so I have uh, 0, 1, 0, 0, right? If I shift that left, I basically push a new 0 in 
on the right hand side and I push all the digits over one and then the zero that was on the leftmost side just basically falls into the trash metaphorically. So now I'm left with one zero 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 which is an eight. I've doubled it. If I shift it right then the opposite happens, right? I basically push it back over and I have a four. I have zero one zero zero. Now of course what bit I add on the left is important, right? If I add a zero or a one uh, that might denote whether it's a positive or negative number, right? Depending on uh, the complementary uh, representation. Um, and the fact that I'm throwing this bit away also matters, right? So that's what denotes a shift versus a rotate. A rotate, I don't throw the bit away that falls off the end. I bring it around and I use it on the other side. So if it was a zero, if I'm shifting left and it was a zero on the left, I would take that zero and I would insert it into the new spot on the right that was caused by now the rotate, right? This can be used uh, for mathematical operations, like I said, doubling and halving. Um, it also can be used when you want to just straight up combine the information um, from two pieces of information. Say you had two snippets of four bit uh, binary numbers and you wanted to put those together in an 8-bit register. You can also use operations like this to achieve that goal. Uh, here are some of the actual um, operations to do that. So I have instructions for logical shifts, arithmetic shifts, rotates, um, to find the absolute value, uh, convert uh, between int and float, which I might want to do if I'm, say, uh, you know, going now from an integer number to a floating point number and I want to actually do uh, the floating point arithmetic on that instead of integer arithmetic. Uh, subtract, multiply, divide, all these good things. Um, we also here at the bottom have some branch and call. I'm going to talk more to call specifically because that really deserves its own video as to what a call is. Um, it's an important concept and I want to make sure that we spend uh, an adequate amount of time on that one.